Um, so the purpose of the Counseling Research and Leadership Lab at Oregon State University is to provide a space to further the learning and sharing of information specifically within the field of counseling. Um, and we're most interested in those areas of research and leadership. Um, we believe that posting these webinars for free public viewing online can also create a resource for the counseling professions as we design classes, develop research, and work in the professional counseling field. So today, our webinar is really going to focus on um, doctoral students' uh, leadership development and specifically with the context, within the context of a recent cross-cultural immersion experience in Malaysia. Um, so with that, I would like to present our speakers today. So we are um, pleased to have Kripali Michaels, Danielle Render Termod, and Yun Shi with us today. Um, so Kripali Michaels is a PhD student in the Counselor Education Program at Oregon State University, a licensed professional counselor in Oregon and Ohio, and the supervisor of the Adult Outpatient Department at the Klamath Basin Behavioral Health. Um, Danielle Render Termod specializes in working with survivors of trauma as a counseling professional, as a doctoral student in counseling at Oregon State University and an instructor at Multnomah University. Uh, Danielle is also a Psychology Today blog author um, focusing on trauma. Um, Yun Shi is a marriage and family therapist licensed in both California and Oregon, a QA manager at Asian Health and Service Center in Portland, and a doctoral student at Oregon State University. So I'm very excited to welcome each of them here today. So please join me in welcoming Kripali, Danielle, and Yun. And I'll pass that off to you all. Awesome. So I think I am starting. Uh, Danielle and Yoon, let me know if I'm doing this wrong. Um, so <laughs> you're doing great. Probably. Thanks. <laughs> um, so we are here today to talk about the the experience that we had in Malaysia this past summer, um, and Yoon will give you some more details when she gets into her her personal presentation. Um, so real quickly, what I'm going to do is go through. Um, the objectives. Uh, so through this program, I need you guys over here, um, we will be discussing the key elements of cross-cultural experiences in counselor education training. Um, you'll be able to understand how culture, cross-cultural immersion experiences enhance and focus effective leadership development. Um, you will be able to describe three effective strategies to enhance leadership identity development within a cross-cultural immersion experience. And then at the end, you will also be able to identify three cross-cultural or international concerns that require further attention within the counseling scholarship for professional development. Um, and then just real quickly, just so you guys kind of have an idea of the structure of this um, presentation. Uh, we'll review some of the literature on the importance of cross-cultural immersion. Um, and then you, myself, and Danielle will be um, presenting our personal experiences and we'll be sharing our own literature, mini literature reviews that we've done based on um, our experiences and perspectives. And then, um, yeah, and then basically, um, uh, Yoon will be covering the, the second objective, I'll be covering the third, and Danielle will be covering the fourth. So I'm going to hand it off to Yoon then. Okay, so I think before we start, we'd like to uh, share with you why are we here today? You know, you spent Saturday morning with us. So literature review provides a background this to uh, um, highlight the importance of the um, cultural immersion experiences. Um, cultural immersion experiences in a nutshell are an important avenue for developing cultural competence and they foster raised awareness, challenging of personal frameworks and appreciation uh, just a second, of uh, diverse cultures and then development of cultural empathy. So I'll pass it down to Kropali. Yeah, so um... And then uh, an important role in, it plays an important role in increasing commitment to social justice. Um, and then counselors and counselor educators uh, are exposed to cultures and values outside of uh, their personal, uh, their own values and cultures. And I'll share the last part of the literature review. It also can be transformative to the counseling and counselor educator students, and it plays a critical role in globalization of the profession and generates a level of learning that is not seen in other conventional courses. And so this is just to give you kind of a, 
a brief intro to what you will hear about today and to give you some highlights on what the literature says about it. So I'm going to now let Yoon jump into her presentation. Oh, you and your might, you're muted. <laughs> so here I am, here I am. So in the past summer, in summer 2019, 11 of us from the Oregon State University Counseling PhD Department went to Malaysia under the leadership of Dr. Ng to uh, start a week of intensive cultural immersion in which we did whole day presentation to local counseling professionals. We went to universities and the schools to offer workshops. And we had these multiple discussions with local professionals. We attended the first inauguration, the inauguration of uh, the Malaysian mental health counselor meeting. And then we visit a variety of local agencies, nonprofits serving mental health needs. It's because of experience, we were all impacted. We came back um, profoundly, in a say, in a way, we came back profoundly impacted by the experience. So it's our honor and pleasure to share some of our learnings with you. Um, for, to start with, my piece of the presentation will highlight some of the key elements in cross-cultural experiences. Counselor education training covers a variety of topics in different settings. What makes the cross-cultural experience unique? So in my understanding, I think the first piece of it is a cultural disequilibrium piece. The students were sent to a brand new environment in which they no longer know for sure who they are, where they belong, and what they should be doing. Um, different authors call it with different terms, but fundamentally there is a process for of a culture shock. And then there's a reflection on our own held beliefs um, and then frame of work. And to see, hmm, does it apply to this new culture? If it doesn't apply, what's going on? How should I adapt? So this kind of experience will serve as a catalyst for self-exploration. Then we're going to we'll go to the next slide. Another piece to it, which make this experience unique and memorable, is the intense emotions involved in this. While we were there, um, first of all, students um, from different literatures shared uh, similar ex emotional experiences. They were um, they were shocked, frustrated, angry, guilty, ashamed disappointed or indignant. And then meanwhile, they also experience the positive emotions such as excited, inspired, and mood and curious. To give you all an uh, example, some of us went to see an agency serving Qing refugee children. I have to um, I'm belong to a group that gave a presentation on suicide prevention at a local university. So I didn't get to go, but I heard a lot of reflection after that. So people were shocked and frustrated and even angry at the condition the Qin refugee children um, have to live their everyday life and the lack of resources they have. Some of my um, cohorts in the group felt guilty and ashamed for the plentifulness of resources they had in the United States. And they were indignant when we went to visit another agency serving refugee children that had so much more resources. People were thinking, how come the Chin refugee children did not have as much resources? But along with such emotions, there were uh, inspiration to do more. And we were excited and inspired by the leader of the Chin refugee children um, agency. And then people were definitely touched. We decided that we're going to donate all the um, income we had from all the presentations to this agency. And then people were thinking about different ways they can raise money um, for this agency after coming back to the United States. So another piece to it is the cognitive expansion. People began to ask bigger, harder questions. So this is a natural flow from the culture shock and from the self-examination. After examining the previously held um, beliefs on 
our social, professional, or cultural beliefs, and after questioning the frame of reference, we began to try to adapt our existing schemas to incorporate new information and thus introduce new ways of thinking. Another piece that we noticed is we place, began to place counseling in a bigger social, cultural, and political context. For example, some of us presented on suicide, suicide prevention, and suicide discussion is um, a national focus in Malaysia right now because of the increasing um, incidence of suicide. However, in Malaysia, suicide is anti-Muslim religion and is regarded as unethical and illegal. So this is a very different social, cultural, and the political context when we talk about suicide, and then that affects how people do the work. So in the end, hopefully, we'll develop a cross-cultural and a global perspective. The last piece, hopefully, is cultural transformation. I think we are still in the middle of it, maybe even at the beginning of it. But I can see that we're starting. Different authors observed um, transformation as a result of cultural, cross-cultural experiences in other students um, going to different parts of the culture. There's the cultural self-awareness began to be more clear about who we are, um, where we're coming from, and how, how we do what we do, why we do what we do. And then witnessing the peer growth um, and then began to build a global connection appreciate for diversity and begin to develop, develop cultural empathy and begin to have an increased commitment to social justice. I think our group experienced all of this. And then also one part that I think wasn't adequately touched in the literature, but in our experience is our acute awareness of power position and the racial dynamics when we were in Malaysia. There was active discussion before, during, and afterwards. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit more of that, and I think my colleagues are going to talk more to that. So we experienced, um, if we can, yes, thank you. <laughs> during this, because of such intensive emotional and cognitive experience, we experienced some conflicts within ourselves and within the group. And I believe um, we reached solidarity in the end. And at, as a result, we began to form our emerging advocacy and leadership identity. Yes, I think now we can move on. Thank you. So some of the dangers and the challenges for cross-cultural experiences. One is the danger of imposing modern colonialism and patronizing professionalism. So we have been very careful against um, this position that we are coming from the US, a more advanced place in terms of counseling to teach Malaysian colleagues how to do counseling. And then we were very careful not to impose our belief onto the local, um, on, onto the local cultural norm. But on the other hand, when we were there, there's conflicts between the cultural norm and then the professional ethical and legal standards we were trained here. For example, when we went to a local middle school to give workshop on stress reduction, the school counselor asked us to submit students questionnaires and their sharing to the school at the end of the workshop without telling the students. And that posed a challenge on our legal and ethical standards. And then we debated on that and then have to tell them, no, we're not going to do it. Um, so this is one incidence of that clash. Now we can move on to the next one. So there's challenges in order for students to grow. We have to challenge them to put them out of their comfort zone. Meanwhile, we have to provide support. So when I look at our experience, I feel like support was so important in making the experience work. I divided the support into three different portions. Um, there's a, the administrative support. Logic, where do people live? How do people get around? How do we keep in touch? We use WhatsApp, um, which happened to be a very effective way to communicate. And then there's a tremendous amount of coordination cross-culturally before um, the internship and during it. 
And then there's the internship requirement, the design of the internship to uh, tie everything together. And the educational piece, supervision plays an essential role in the learning experience, I seem to me. We have daily supervision when we were there, in which people debrief on their activities that day, talk about their thoughts and the feelings in a very open and supportive manner. And then in which the there's a guided reflection. The supervisor who is bilingual and bicultural, he can provide us with a local perspective um, in um, yeah, in helping us to absorb what we saw. And then there's a conversation with the local colleagues, Malaysian colleagues and the students, presentations and workshops in universities and the schools, and the field visits to local nonprofits. And the emotional piece, there's personal experience, emotions triggered by personal experience and triggered by the shared experience as a group those emotional piece are very important and they need support. Now, I think we're moving on to my last slide, strategies to enhance learning. I think you all, all heard about strategies throughout my presentation, but to summarize it, one of the most important strategies, at least it seemed to me, and then the literature is to have ongoing process and reflection and dialogue in a very supportive environment because people, students do feel vulnerable in a brand new environment. So, so a supportive and safe environment on for such reflection and processing is important. And then, well, as we all know in the um, experiential learning theory, we have the experience, we have the reflection, then we need to conceptualize it to uh, make it cognitively to um, to, re to uh, um, further inform the framework, cognitive framework. So the conceptualization part was brought on by the literature review and then by, um, I think, by the supervisor, which is Dr. Ng's input. Um, and then throughout the internship, we actively challenge our assumptions and stereotypes. And this, I think this is important. And local perspective, as I mentioned, local perspective is very important in this case it was provided through Dr. Ng and through our discussion with the local Malaysian colleagues. Another piece that's important is preparation before um, we were asked to review literature, to get familiar with Malaysian culture and the mental health system. And then after the experience, we were asked to uh, um, provide posts and the journals to uh, reflect on the experience. I think that tied the experience together. I think that is my presentation. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm just gonna kind of jump into mine um, and talk a little bit about the preparation that uh, Dr. Ng had helped us with and then also uh, what, what we experienced or what I experienced um, in Malaysia. Um, so my topic or the major theme um, during, my, during the trip was having the marginalized counselor identity. And so I wanted to speak to that piece a little bit. Um, so what I wanted to start with was essentially the search, um, the search for literature. So I, uh, when I sought references for this, um, presentation, I used a variety of um, search engines like Google Scholar, PsychInfo, uh, just the general OSU library search bar. Um, and I ended up coming up with five articles that met my criteria on marginalized counselor identity. Um, and two of them are dissertations in progress. So, um, and I use keywords like marginalized and counselor, uh, uh, minority counselor, marginalized identity, counseling identity, um, identity development, and counselor of color. So I'm sure there's a lot of other things that I hadn't thought of um, that you know I can go back and try to figure out, but those were the ones that really stood out to me, and so that's what I had used. Um, so what I'd like to do is just briefly review the literature that I did find. Um, and I think the one beautiful thing out of my search was that basically, there was an abund abundant 
um, abundant resource abundancy and resources for um, multicultural competency. So working with clients of a different culture. Um, if you were to go search that right now in Google Scholar, I'm sure you would easily find 30 to 40 articles that meet criteria. Um, but that did not answer my question about the marginalized counselor identity. So uh, one of the uh, articles that I did find was the Bain and Bronco who focused on the topic of broaching among um, counselors uh, of color and white clients. And so some of the takeaways that I found that were important were that uh, you know, counselor training and supervision is tasked with ensuring that students are prepared to work with diverse populations. However, counselors of color often have different experiences in training and practice and thus may have different preparation needs. There's also the absence of faculty of color and diverse clinical perspective perspectives that can also result in feelings of isolation as students of co color often wonder how what they are learning applies to them. So um, the second article, th th those were the two main points that I uh, took away from there. And then in the David, uh, let me see if I can say this right, just just Samino uh, article, uh, one of the major points that I took away was that there is a concern that practitioners observable statuses such as race or gender influence clients perceptions of their competence. When engaged in interactions with white people, minority people are at risk of experiencing status expectations effects. Because of their societally ascribed lower status, minority people are frequently thought to be less uh, professionally capable. Um, and these are, as you can see, this was an article from 1994, but in my personal experience um, as a counselor of color, um, I've seen that more often than I'd like to see it. So uh, moving on to the third uh, article that I found was uh, Matt and Wim's grant winning Rogers and Bes Besquet, sorry, Besquez. Um, so the major point that I uh, took from that article was that it is important for minority students are, uh, there are various initiatives to increase cultural diversity and the number of students and faculty of color in graduate programs, a desire to gain knowledge and use that knowledge to give back to the community. So doing something about the fact that you are a counselor of color um, and bringing awareness to that so that the identity development piece can be shaped in some way or form. So um, I'm just gonna jump into my, my story or my piece real quickly there. Um, I think that uh, we were, as Yoon had said, we were well prepared before, during, and after the experience. But you can never really um, prepare for the emotions that come up. Um, and so Dr. Ng did a really great job preparing us for the Malaysian experience beforehand. We had reviewed literature on the social and cultural factors associated with the Malaysian culture. Uh, we were prepared with collaborative, uh, we were prepared in the collaborative relationships that we were aiming to make with IMU and the professional growth that we would hopefully experience. Um, but I knew walking into this, my, my experience would be a little bit different from the others in the group because uh, Malaysian culture has such a strong South Indian influence. Uh, so I knew there would be a lot of people in a sense that looked like me. Um, so we learned that um, we also learned that, sorry, Indian, um, Indians are at the bottom rung of society in Malaysia. And so there was some self-doubt in walking into this experience, but I think my curiosity was a lot stronger than my self-doubt. Uh, and I was very, very pleasantly surprised by um, the people that we encountered there, um, especially at IMU, the coordinators, the participants, the co-presenters, all that. They were very warm and welcoming. Um, one of my aha moments, though, I experienced was the fact that I was a majority in this country. I, um, I knew there would be a lot of Indian faces, but I hadn't grasped the concept of how many more. And so it was a very e weird experience for me because I've never been part of the majority, even in my trips to India, where um, I'm seen as the Americanized Indians, and that's a whole different level of stigma. Um, but it was very comforting and empowering to be a part of this majority. And um, 
the other aha moment that I had while in Malaysia was seeing the influential Indian women who were counselors. Um, I've grown up in a very, uh, in a bi-culture that in which women are soft-spoken, kept to themselves and didn't really question authority or men for that matter. And I'm not, sh I'm sure this is not the case for um, all Indians, but this is just something that's happened in my um, micro, uh, micro system, sorry. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I, I just had never experienced a loud Indian woman. Um, and I was very uh, inspired with the pride um, that these women represented in the community. And so the summit that um, Yoon had mentioned earlier at IMU on the last, last few days uh, were very important to me because I, I saw that, um, you know, I didn't have to be that quiet Indian counselor. I could make a difference. I could do something. Um, the women that uh, spoke up were very passionate about what they did, and um, I could see the influence they had on the people around them. And so, um, yeah, it was just a very inspirational process for me. And, you know, it, it propelled me into thinking about how I want to advocate um, and I want to be a loud social justice warrior, in a sense, um, for counselors of color or of marginalized backgrounds here in the United States. Um, and what I'll do is go over some strategies that you and Danielle and I had discovered from our experiences and, help, and we're hoping that this will help supervisors and educators help their supervisees and students. So moving into strategies, um, one of the major strategies uh, that we looked at was just understanding that marginalized counselor, um, uh, sorry, counselors with marginalized identities um, will have a different development. They will have a different trajectory based on their cultural uh, status and their social needs. Um, just giving them the room and advocating for them to immerse or network with counselors and professionals of similar cultures will empower them to learn their niche in the counseling counseling field um, in, in the United States at least. Uh, this is definitely not to negate the immersion of um, counselors into different cultures, but I think it's also important to be surrounded by people, especially for um, marginalized identities, to be surrounded by those that are similar. And I want to point out that in the United States, it's very, uh, it's been backwards for counselors that are from marginalized backgr uh, backgrounds because in a sense they grew up with dissimilarity and now they're becoming comfortable with similarity um, as they network. So that was the first strategy. The second strategy we uh, looked into was uh, advocating and modeling opportunities to immerse counselors and educators um, in different cultures. So I think this is a given at this point, but I want to emphasize the practice of um, modeling as a supervisor or educator. So, um, you know, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with how scary it can be as a student to walk into something new or immerse yourself into something new. And so um, I think it's so important and I'm kind of going to put Dr. Ng on the spot because he does such a great job modeling. Um, you know, he, he hangs out with, with us casually and um, just, you know, taking us on this or giving us this opportunity uh, for this trip is, was so important and for him to come with us, I think was even more important um, because it was a matter of, this is something he believed in. And so, it, you know, it, I think it adds a lot more value to the experience. Um, but, you know, a strategy could be something as big as visiting a different country <laughs> with your supervisees or your uh, students, or it can be something as small as just casually hanging out with them and getting, you know, food from different cultures or visiting different cultural centers or something like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then the third strategy that we had identified was, um, utilizing cross-cultural experiences to expand counselor awareness and aid students in confronting cultural blindness and blind spots. Uh, we all have blind spots no matter who we are and I think it's important to keep, um, it, we you know, definitely believe it's important to keep one another accountable, which requires a lot of honesty, authenticity, respect, and proactive relationship building with your students or supervisees. 
Um, so I'm gonna kind of pass it on to Danielle because she's gonna talk a little bit more about those blind spots. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. Okay, so um, like Krupali said, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about addressing the cultural blindness and blind spots um, as students are going through this process and supporting them through this process. Um, so as I go through this, I'm going to address a little bit about what is cultural blindness, what are cultural blind spots, review some of the literature, um, on cultural blind spots and, and blindness um, and how cultural immersion experiences can aid in altering these biases and false beliefs that, that counselors and counselor educators may hold. Share a little bit about my story and my experience throughout this process. Then I'll also go into the effective strategies to enhance leadership development because that's important and what we've all been talking about is just being able to foster this leadership um, with counselors and counseling, um, counselor educators, and then just share some final thoughts with you. So going into cultural blindness and blind spots, the American Psychological Association defines cultural blindness as the inability to understand how particular matters might be viewed by people of a different culture because of a rigid adherence to the views, attitudes, and values of one's own culture or because the perspective of one's own culture is sufficiently limiting to make it difficult to see alternatives. So that's a very long and definition to basically say that a person is blind to and unable to see other cultural values and beliefs and their merit because of their own ethnocentric um, rigid beliefs that they might hold. And one of the issues with this, and one of the reasons that both of these terms are called um, blindness or blind spots, is that often they're subconscious, which we'll go into a little bit further, which makes them even more limiting. Um, the second term you'll hear is cultural blind spots, which there, there's not necessarily a formal definition. I had a challenge, challenging time finding this throughout the literature, and actually more literature needs to be done on this issue. But um, Nichols 2019 describes it as unconscious biases that can lead to harmful behaviors, assumptions, and interactions with others. And so understandably, having cultural blindness and cultural blind spots can be very limiting for counselors, counselor educators, and leaders in our field and our profession, because our, our entire profession is built on being intentional or in interactions to support and empower and advocate. And with these blind spots and this blindness, it can be challenging to do so. Um, one thing I will note before moving on is actually, as I was looking through the literature, I found a very practical example of how cultural blindness and cultural blind spots can pop up for us. And um, for me, I was struck by discovering that cultural blindness and cultural blind spots, just the terms themselves, have actually by, by some been noted as being ableist in nature. And so I wanted to recognize that I, I found it as a very beautiful example of how this was something that I hadn't even thought of previously before reading people advocating against these terms, um, especially considering they're all throughout our literature. And so I wanted to note that. Um, I also wanted to note that for the purpose of this presentation and for it, it being brief, I'm going to continue to use these terms specifically because it's challenging to discuss literature without using the terminology within the literature. And yet I also want to mention that in no way um, do we support the ableism that might be utilized with these terms and just make a note of that and so that we're all aware as we go through this literature. And so I'll next discuss the importance of confronting cultural biases. So cultural blindness and blind spots are common and pervasive even in the counseling profession. And so the issue, one of the big issues with this is that we all can deal with cultural blindness and blind spots to varying levels dependent upon our history, um, our experiences, but yet it's very important for us all to be challenged and to be able to recognize if we do have any of these cultural blind spots or blindness. Additionally, cultural blindness can be subliminal and subconsciously hinder a counselor or counselor educator from being effective and competent. So like I previously mentioned, a big issue is that it's subconscious. And so if people aren't even aware that these biases are coming up, then it's very hard to do anything with them. And these biases can then lead a person's interactions and um, hinder them from being as effective as they would like to be and potentially harming others. Um, additionally, Cultural blindness is negatively correlated with multicultural knowledge and awareness. And so um, I, I found this 
in, particularly empowering and powerful because, and you'll hear a little bit more about my story in, in, in the future, but um, it's, it's very challenging if we have these biases and these blind spots to be able to be multiculturally competent. If we aren't able to see the value and the merit and other cultural beliefs and value systems, then we're not going to be able to support them adequately and we are hindered ourselves in being able to be competent as professionals. And so this just demonstrates how important it is as a profession to be able to constantly be asking yourself, what are our cultural blind spots? Where are we blind and what can we do about it? And so why do I share this? Well, the cross-cultural learning experiences experience has a, is a really powerful tool to aid in combating these cultural biases. And the literature discusses this, um, which, and my own experience as well. But the, so Perrin, Tolerant, and Fisher discuss how acceptance and respect to others becomes attainable when a counselor works to recognize and understand their, the views and perceptions of different culture they're engaging with. And so immersive, immersive multicultural experiences allow the counselor to be in an experience where they're able to then be surrounded by people who have different values, who have different experiences, um, under, learn to understand them or work to understand them and allows them to engage in a new way with their own beliefs and while they're getting exposure to these new cultures, um, potentially new cultures for them. Santos 2014 notes that the fundamental first way to gain awareness involves exposure and reflection. And so I want to pause for a second and mention um, and note a little bit about the term exposure. So um, a number of you, if not all of you, I'm sure have heard about the challenge in um, ch the phenomenon in psychology of in-group out-group bias, where we have biases towards our in-group people who are like us and bias um, and stereotypes and prejudice against people who are in our out-group. Yet there's something called the mere exposure effect, where we are finding that even just the mere exposure of different cultures and people who are in our outgroup or who are different than us can lead us to then increase our preference for those, um, those different types of people. And then they can become a part of our microsystem and then become in our in-group, which is really fascinating. And so just kind of stepping, a, stepping out for a second regarding that exposure, but it's really powerful to be able to come to know people who in our mind have been different from us and then recognize that they're not so different from us. And that in itself, that exposure helps to challenge those biases that are really subliminal. Um, Santos furthers that experiential learning activities are a powerful way to raise the awareness and challenge personal frameworks. And so within this exposure, be able to then raise awareness of biases that are coming up that may not have been able to be present, presented before without that exposure. And then once that, um, those, that awareness is present to then challenge those frameworks that have potentially been limiting and harmful and leading to behaviors and attitudes that are not desirable. Prosec and Michael 2016 then go on to discuss how the exposure and value systems in immersive experiential learning can encourage students to alter their worldview. And so this is really powerful and I really appreciated this finding because for me this was very applicable. Um, this exposure allowed me to, and I'll go into this a little bit more in a second, but recognize my biases that I had that I didn't even know I was holding um, and limitations in my understanding and then be able to alter my worldview accordingly. And so I'll go a little bit into my story here. So I grew up in the South, um, the deep South of the United States as a Caucasian female. And so within that um, cultural environment and that upbringing there, I was um, unfortunate, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I was riddled, it was riddled with privilege and power um, that growing up in the South, I might not necessarily have been as cognizant of in different ways. And um, I had a lot of multicultural experiences growing up. Um, there were, I, I lived in the Atlanta metro area, and so there were a number of cultures I came in contact with, but I will note that um, one of the cultural experiences that I did not have a lot of exposure to in the area that I lived was actually various Asian cultures. Um, and I had previously had experience before Malaysia to going to India um, and supporting an organization that works with women in the red light districts there women and children in the red light districts there. And yet there were still so many limits to my understanding prior to this Malaysian experience. And so this experience was incredibly powerful for me because as I went into this, this culture and this, this, new, this new country um, with a, not only the Malaysian culture, but there's a diversity of cultures within it. And so um, Krupali and Yoon talked a little bit about how not only are there, um, there's just a variety of cultures, there's Indian, 
culture, Chinese, Malaysian, and a number of other cultures that I can't even name. And so it was very powerful for me because as I stepped into this environment, um, immediately I was confronted with my own biases and limits to understanding of these various cultures that I didn't recognize I had before which was incredibly challenging. Um, and I appreciated how Yoon was discussing the guilt and shame earlier because I was special, the, for the majority of the trip, I was battling the shame and this guilt coming up of these misconceptions that I didn't even realize were there prior to this trip. And yet as a counseling professional, a counselor educator, and even just a human being and a person, I was so grateful for the experience of this shame and guilt to surface because it allowed me to recognize and have more self-awareness that I couldn't have had without this exposure and without meeting people um, and hearing their stories and getting to know um, their values and their belief systems. And so once that awareness became attainable for me, like the literature was discussing or pieces of that awareness, because I'm always going to be growing and learning more awareness, like all of us. But once those pieces became more attainable for me and more tangible for me, I then was able to go, how do I want this to fit into my worldview, my, my view of people and the world? And I was able to change that. And so um, it's a challenging to discuss these experiences because it's never fun and I even feeling guilt right now as I discuss this. And yet it's such an important piece to discuss because if people who have power and privilege and who have, hold these biases are not willing to discuss them and confront them, then we can't make the changes that we would like to within ourselves and within the profession. And so um, one last note that I will say, and just kind of building off of what Kupali and Yoon were noting is some of the discomfort that came up with from me was the, the very, um, being very cognizant while I was there of the, the privilege that I held um, and how that made me incredibly uncomfortable. And yet that discomfort was, um, very important to be able to sit with and um, experience because it allowed me to recognize that privilege coming up in a way that I could then confront and do something about it and not exploit that privilege. Um, and so I just thought it was important to share that piece of my story. And as I shared, it's, it's challenging to talk about and discuss and potentially listen to and hear. And I apologize for any discomfort coming up. And at the same time, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to share it because that discomfort is very important for all of us to wrestle with and then to be able to impart in our students and supervisees as we're um, going through the profession and supporting them as they're working through that this. So the final piece of my portion of the presentation is I want to discuss effective strategies to enhance leadership development. And so, um, we were discussing how, and, and you touched on this earlier, the reflection on experiences to foster self-awareness and transformative learning is crucial. And so what I was mentioning a lot was exposure, yet that exposure is not enough. And so the exposure lays a very powerful foundation for change and for growth, and yet reflection is absolutely um, paramount to then foster that change and to continue that change versus just the exposure itself. And so like Yoon was talking about, we had a lot of reflection as a group where we would come together and discuss what we, our emotions, what we were going through, what we were thinking, what we were witnessing. But we also had personal reflection time as well. A number of us were keeping our own journals of our reflective experiences. And we also had activities and assignments afterwards to continue that reflection in a more structured way. Additionally, another effective strategy with the immersion experience is to incorporate and the, incor the incorporation and development of a leadership framework so Dr. Ong had each of us prior to the trip um, submit a, our leadership statement and discuss our own leadership frameworks that we kind of see the world by. This was really helpful because not only did it help us tap into who we want to be as leaders in our development, but also while we were there, a number of us were discussing how our development continued to be consistent or strengthened through this experience or changed based on our experiences. And so this is a really powerful way to continue to foster that leadership development in students as they're going through this experience. Additionally, a final piece is action steps. Um, and so Dr. Ung ha asked us to do an advocacy project after our experience, which was particularly powerful because not only did we have the experience and the exposure, we had the reflection piece, and then we had to do something with it. And so it didn't just sit there and rattle around in our brain, but I know a number of us were really appreciative of this because this advocacy project allowed us to have an outlet to do something with all that we were creating and wrestling with throughout this experience. Um, and so I'll share a personal anecdote on that and experience and how this was personally very edifying for me. So while I was um, in Malaysia, I co-presented on the topic of trauma, um, which is particular, this is, this is my 
topic of interest as I specialize in working with survivors of trauma and I really appreciate having the ability to advocate and work towards destigmatizing trauma and the um, traumatization and the effects of it. And so while I was there, one of the, the really impactful experiences for me was during that presentation, the, the presentees and um, my co-presenter and I had a discussion on the various types of myths and stigmatization surrounding experiencing trauma. And it was really powerful to be able to have this discussion from multicultural perspectives, uh, multiple cultural perspectives, and we all discussed these stigmatizations that were coming up and that we were seeing within our environments and within our clients and within ourselves. Um, and it was really interesting to note during this experience, there were a number of similarities that I hadn't expected, um, cross-cultural similarities in the stigma of trauma, but also there were a number of differences which can be expected. Um, but this experience was particularly powerful for me as I'm working on um, research on re regarding the stigmatization of trauma and how it affects clients. And this just really impacted me to a visceral level and just seeing how all over the world there's this stigma in a variety of ways. And so my action step, my advocacy project was to submit a, um, a proposal to Psychology Today to write an article on this topic. And I received a response from Psychology Today asking me if instead of writing an article, I would consider being an ongoing expert blog author on, or uh, what they call expert, I, I wouldn't call myself that, but uh, um, what they call an expert blog author on the topic of trauma to be able to continue to write advocacy articles on the topic of trauma um, and supporting individuals who struggle with that and just continuing that destigmatization. So this was really, really impactful for me because I am now writing these blog articles and it is absolutely empowering in such a powerful level for me to be able to advocate on such a wide scale that I've never experienced before. Um, and I owe that to, I owe that appreciation to Dr. Ohm and that experience um, to be able to now put this action step in a new way for me. And so a little bit off tangent maybe for a second there, but just to mention just the importance of that action step and being able to encourage our students and those who are going through this immersive experience to be able to put their, their, um, their voice and what they've learned into action. So then they can share their privilege of learning and knowledge with others. And so I'll end the portion of this presentation by saying, by using a quote by Dietzen Baker, 2019, counselor educators who participate in immersive cultural experiences and reflect on the process, embark on an invaluable journey of self-discovery that will shape their development as future counselors and counselor educators, which I will add, and leaders. And so um, I'll speak a little bit for Yunin Kripali here for a second, just because I, they've shared this with me, but for all of us, this is true, um, that we all embarked on an invaluable journey of self-discovery that shaped our development as people and as counselors and counselor educators in really powerful ways. And we're really grateful for this experience. Um, and we all are really passionate about continuing these types of experiences for counseling students and counselor educators, which is why we're here. And so we wanna thank you for, for hearing all of our experiences and the literature behind it um, that are supporting our experiences and, and pro propelling for future experiences like this for other students and professionals. And we will now jump into a discussion portion. And so before we open up the floor for you to ask us questions and we share our thoughts and our answers, we'd love to ask you some questions. Um, we are very collaborative in nature <laughs> in our cohort and as counselor educators, and we really appreciate being able to hear other people's inputs as well. And so we'd love to ask a couple of questions if you'd be willing to share your thoughts. The first is, after this presentation, what do you believe are some of the key ways in which cultural immersion experiences will foster leadership development and cultural competency in counselors and counselor educators. And so any thoughts that each, any of you have on this, we'd really appreciate hearing. Then I'll jump at once. And we're big on empowerment. So if you're not, if you don't, if you're not comfortable answering questions, that's okay too. <laughs> we will not be offended. <laughs> or we throw you a lot of information and then there's some, we want to give you a little bit more space for reflection and thinking. So in that case, maybe I will share with you our next question, you know, just invite you for 
discussion, invitation for discussion, and then we can use the next half an hour as a chance for us to uh, have a dialogue. So we also want, when are uh, curious, what are some of the personal takeaways for you from this presentation as a professional, as a counselor educator in training? Does this presentation prompt any personal takeaways or action steps for you? So those are some of the questions we have for you. And then we are also welcome any questions you may have for us. I think one of the um, takeaways for me was about the thought of exposure. Um, and I know that's just kind of like a simple step and it's, you know, more at the foundation level, but I think that's really important because if you are not exposed to a certain culture, um, then you might not really be aware of what it's all about. So I think even exposure, even though it's not such a huge step in the whole process, I think is really important. Um, like for me personally, I live in a pretty diverse city, but I'm not exposed to every single culture here. Um, so I think maybe going out of my comfort level um, and and putting myself in experiences where I'm exposed to more um, would be a good starting step towards that um, competency and being able to, you know, work with people from more cultures. I appreciate you sharing that, um, Violetta, and, and you're mm -hmm. absolutely correct. And I really, um, something that really stands out to me is just the awareness you already have in the potential limitations in, in recognizing that you don't, we don't know all of the cultures until mm -hmm. we're exposed to them. And so I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I agree with you. It's a very important step for all of us to be able to intentionally better understand cultures and exposures a big piece of it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no problem. I think something that really stood out for me that Kripali discussed was the um, different experiences, especially in identity development for counseling students of color and how important it is that we have counselor educators of color and that we're recruiting both diverse students and faculty and then supporting them um, through their identity development and work with clients from, who are often from dominant culture. Absolutely. Thanks, Sophia. <laughs> yeah. I also appreciated um, the comments about the importance of the counselor educator coming alongside students in their experiences and not just encouraging students to go out into the community to have, um, it, like Violetta was talking about, exposure to different cultures, but for us as future counselor educators to take an active role in having those experiences with our students and showing our investment and modeling for students um, and, and being there to support them through those experiences. And I was thinking about what Violetta said, um, that sometimes those experiences can just be in the community that we're that we live. Um, it doesn't mean we have to go to a foreign country to have those experiences, um, but how can we create those opportunities um, just in our community as well? So um, that was not something I had considered before is how important it will be to um, also immerse myself in that experience with students. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that takeaway from um, your experience in Malaysia with Dr. Ng. Well, yeah, thank you, Alison. I'd like to comment on that. One of the um, papers, one of the literature that we I reviewed talk about students' normal response when they are in a brand new environment. There's a freezing that I really don't know <laughs> what I'm doing. I don't, and then there's an avoidance um, because of the concern of power and the position. And I don't want to say anything. Um, because I don't want to impose anything. And then there's a false assumption. So even if we don't see anything, there's assumption based on our framework reference. And because such natural responses, it is very important to have the faculty member, professor, supervisor coming in to provide another aspect, the conceptualization to help the student go through these barriers so they can reach a new level of understanding. 
So I didn't realize how important it is to have such kind of support and supervision before. Um, even when I was there, I enjoyed it, but I really only come to full appreciation of it while doing this, preparing for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And if I might um, add something and just share a little bit more too. So as Ian was talking about with that guilt and the shame, mm -hmm. um, I, I recognize particularly just how important it was to have Dr. Ong walk alongside of each of us as we were dealing with our own guilt or shame as it was coming up so that he was able to help us navigate those emotions and reflect on them versus potentially pushing them down, which is very typical of the American culture um, in particular, but, um, or even just to kind of go into survival mode to get the tasks done. But instead he just was a very supportive and encouraged us to continue to reflect on them and to lean into that, which was very important because it might not necessarily have been everyone's natural response. And so um, just a, a, another piece that I recognize just the importance while we were there of having a um, a, a counselor educator who is very cognizant of the process and was willing to walk through the hard parts of it with us. Yeah, if I can add one piece, at one point we do have, we, we had daily supervision at the end of the long day. I remember at a certain point there was resistance in the group. Mm -hmm. Some of the group members said we're supervised that. We, <laughs> we had too much process and reflection and we didn't want to talk anymore. And yet, you know, we breathed on under the leadership of Dr. Ng. And so I, everybody got so much after that as a result. So I just want to say resistance could be part um, of the response that we can expect. It's funny, you know, I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> to work through the resistance with mm -hmm. the students, because there will be, um, especially for intensive um, experiences like visiting a different country in a different culture. I had a question about um, suicide being illegal in Malaysia. Um, when you guys discussed suicide awareness, did you feel like you received any pushback from the community there? Well, maybe I'll try some of this issue. Um, Gretchen, Gideon, another cohort member, Margaret and me, we went to a, a local university to um, talk about suicide pre um, prevention. I think overall our impression is the response was positive. So okay. on one hand, yes, it is illegal and it's regarded to be anti the Muslim religion. On the other hand, it's happening. It is the big elephant in the room and people are recognizing it, whether or not we talk about it, it's happening, especially among the younger generation. So I think there were around maybe 80 to 90 people showing up for our presentation. Oh, wow. A little bit really, um, yeah, surprised us. So the response I have to say, I've been, people were very engaged on um, response was overwhelmingly positive in the, because of the need. We also, but it, you know, we, it does affect how people do the work because the next day we went to a local suicidal prevention hotline to talk with the long-term volunteers and visit the site. And the hotline was working and then they received a small amount of funding from the government. So on one hand, the funding resource was limited from the government. Um, and then the second piece is confidentiality was of utmost importance because of law and then the stigma. So they absolutely do not track people and there's no collaboration with the police. If you send someone is acutely suicidal or un unstable, but once they are off the phone, there's nothing they can do about it. At least that's wow. the reality right now because of, a, I think because of the the social political environment right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Anything you. For, yeah. Thank you for such a good question. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Gretchen? Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to echo exactly what you had shared. Um, I mean, I think you touched on one thing that I think surprised us both is we were originally going to hold a, um, a workshop for about 40 people, and we had nearly 80 signed up, um, and they were all university students, master's students, um, and they were just invested in this topic. So I think, especially within the mental health community, there's a understanding that there is a very intense need for support um, and people want to be able to support 
those in the community. But I think there's still those cultural challenges of the way suicide is perceived um, and the way different um, communities engage with the topic of suicide or perhaps don't engage with it. Mm -hmm. And I think the the comfort of having those level of conversations was something that was brought up by a lot of practitioners and students. Um, so I think the university we were working with was actually doing that as a part of a larger presentation um, to try to do that, um, bring awareness to suicide prevention. So um, I think it was just, as Yoon shared, a lot of the initiatives were underfunded. Um, and I think that's the most challenging thing is there is a need, but there's not investment from the the larger system um into that issue so yeah no my you knew spoke you spoke very uh, articulately about it so thank you yeah thank you corrections thank you oh, yeah. and i think with that i mean i'll just because um to formally transition i mean if anyone has any questions specifically about anything the presenter spoke about or just the experience as a whole, um, now would be the time to kind of ask that. Um, so feel free to ask them any particular piece of the experience that may have uh, resonated with you. Uh, I had a question for, for Yoon. Um, you mentioned when you were talking that um, you were profoundly impacted uh, with this process. And I, I would love to hear from each of you that went, uh, what specific s situation or um, moment uh, was the most impactful for you and why? You all asked really good questions. <laughs> well, I think when we were doing the presentation, because of time limitation, we were thinking one thing we didn't highlight is um, how what um, really fulfilling experience for the three of us to do this presentation together. Because as you can see, we come from different cultural and background, cultural and ethical background. And we each, um, because of our each specific developmental stage and our needs and our background, we encountered different, um, how should I say, um, we have different experiences within the shared experiences. Daniel and Kropali talk about their experience from their background. And then, yes, I didn't share about my um, background a little bit and my experience. For me, it's you know, quite different. I came in as an international student, uh, former international student who have um, been staying in the country for a long time. But my identity when I was in Malaysia, when people look at me, they are not looking at a consular from the United States, I believe. So once they and they, they look at me and then they ask me where I'm from, I said I'm originally from China. And then I think that's the cultural identity that I assume. And then the one thing, so as a result, one thing actually that was profoundly impactful for me, interestingly, is to realize internalized racism. Um, well, this is getting personal, um, but, but, but then this is a, really a profound training experience is before uh, when, when I went back to China um, to train local counselors, I was viewed as the expert. And then I really never reflected on that. I think, okay, I had, a, I have over 10 years of experience as a counselor and then training other counselors. Yes, I have the expertise. But then when we were in Malaysia, when, we, when I was there presenting and talking with my, um, can I say, Caucasian colleagues, and I noticed people definitely direct their attention to my Caucasian colleagues, even if we're talking about the same thing. And then, so for me, one of the impactful moments is in the sharing, the supervision at the end of the, um, the, the long day. And I was seeing, I just feeling something weird that for example, um, like I can see people um, were paying more attention to the Caucasian colleagues than, I, than they did to me, but I'm not sure. I just had this weird feeling about it. And then one of our, one of our group members said, yeah, I noticed that in this 20 minutes of talk we had together, people focused their eye contact on to me and another Caucasian club group member as if they are physically block you, blocking you out of the conversation. Uh, that was a validating 
moment for me because you know being an ethnic minority immigrant here you sense something but sometimes it's not confirmed is it me is it me being sensitive overly sensitive or it's a something that's really going on so for him to recognize that is a powerful validating experience for me yeah and then the related learning to it um related to what I was sharing at the beginning is now I think about it when I went back to China to Chun, was, was I viewed as an expert because of who I am, my training, my experience, or because of part of the privilege I carry with me as being trained and coming from the United States. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Thank you for sharing that, Ian. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So another learning piece for all of us actually is to really recognize um, how should I say racism or internalized racism, how it plays out in everyday life for the entire group. Because sometimes we learn about the concepts on paper and then we didn't really experience it in everyday life. So while we were in Malaysia, because of the, the experiences and because of reflection and then the group discussion, I think we all learned some really you know, profound personal ways about this. Yeah, and I think, um, Yuna, I'm, I'm going to add on to what you were saying, the um, identity piece or the impactful, the impactful event for me was the identity piece, which I did talk about. Um, but um, it was, and I believe you're talking about the same thing, but um, or the same event that you and I were part of, where the um, one of the uh, Indian women that I had referenced was um, diverting her attention to uh, the Caucasian colleague of ours. And so it was one of those things where Yun and I had picked up on something, but we weren't exactly sure. And then Amika was the other one that was with us. She's one of our other cohort members. But um, I think I had I had brushed that off because of what I had experienced beforehand, because she was just so influential in front of the public and what she had done um, like to, for the crowd. And so, um, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it until my cohort members brought it up. And then I was, I was trying to figure out where that was coming from and whether that was just me or if it was, so it, it you, you question yourself, but like you said, in the United States, you don't always, it's not always confirmed. And so you just kind of move on <laughs> with whatever you're doing. Um, but it, in, in that moment, we're talking about it because of the daily supervisions and all that. We, uh, I think we were able to dive deeper into that, that portion of it. Um, so uh, Sherry, I want to make sure I kind of respond to your question, but I don't want to take, uh, I don't want to say very much because I don't want to take away from what Yun and Kripali just said, and I know I've already shared a good bit. Um, I shared one of the pivotal moments for me. I think in general, though, when I think about this experience, the, the entire experience of just having this, I say the word visceral because I could feel it in my bones, just my privilege and power and how uncomfortable and guilty and just that shame that came up for me and just this very, very present recognition of I have privilege um, in this environment where people are asking me or treating me like I'm the expert, even though I'm asking them to share their expertise and their um, cultural values and beliefs regarding like, for example, topics of trauma, and then seeing how my peers were being treated or how I potentially may have been fostering that unintentionally um, with them or other people. It was just this very powerful experience of I have privilege and what am I going to do with that? Um, and am I going to just sit and just let my privilege continue to foster racism or other um, <clears throat> issues that are happening? Or am I going to fight through the discomfort, recognize what's there, see what I can do with it and see in my communities and in my environment and within myself, how I can work towards changing the system and supporting others and empowering others. So that was that would be my response. Thank you for asking that question, Sherry.
Any other thoughts or reflections? Oh, I see you unmuted, Allison. Yeah, I was, you spoke about um, the work that you did around trauma and suicide, um, but you also mentioned that you did some work or folks on the trip did some work in schools. I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about the school experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a school counselor. Gresham, didn't you and Amiko do that? So we'll let you speak to that. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump in as a, as a contributor. Um, yeah, so I actually, my master's is originally in school counseling, even though I work in higher education right now. Um, that is what I was originally trained as. Um, and educational counseling is still, I think, the area where I feel most comfortable kind of residing in. Um, but I co-presented with um, Amika Goka Dubose, who's another, um, member of the um, cohort 69 um, Oregon State uh, mm -hmm. colleague. And we actually did a presentation on um, early childhood trauma and school counseling. Um, so her specialty especially is the early childhood trauma and I kind of spoke to the school counseling. And it was really fascinating, I think, because even though we were quite literally worlds away, some of the same issues were coming mm -hmm. up in terms of just being heavily understaffed as school counselors. And I think that was that was really fascinating for me um, because we were talking about that. We were talking about how to advocate for what the role of a school counselor was. Mm -hmm. And I could have been having those conversations here in New Jersey or in Malaysia. And even though they mm -hmm. looked a little bit different, um, some of those issues still really permeated of how do you talk to an administrator about what you do or why it's important to advocate that you do this and not discipline. And so I think it was really, it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was so fascinating to me that those issues translated and that people were st still grappling with them. Um, but I think it also helped because um, I was able to kind of share some of my experience working in higher education and working in schools in the States um, and able to learn from them as well because they were doing some things that were really creative and there were school counselor educators there that were coming to try to um, find different and exciting ways to share about what they were doing. And I, I really have to give so much credit to Amico for we did this thing called the brain architecture game, um, which if you are not familiar with it, um, it is great. And it was a really cool way to kind of engage folks in conversations about um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool thing. I'll actually, I'll send the link in my resources that I send out, but um, it was a really cool way to engage um, folks in conversations about how those things impact kids um, because they're having some of the same conversations over there about trauma and kids and um, how that impacts what they do as school counselors and how they work with that. So um, I think that was that was specifically the focus of my presentation. And then I'll let someone else kind of talk about the work that we did because we actually went into a high school, uh, middle school as well. So. Yeah, I was gonna say we did visit uh, a high school um, and I think a, a kind of like a suburb of, of uh, Kuala Lumpur, um, or what would be identified as a suburb here. Um, <laughs> so uh, we had a very interesting uh, interaction there, I think. Um, uh, basically, we were coordinating with the school counselor, and um, there was a miscommunication, is what I'm thinking, um, in that, uh, you know, we were there to essentially teach the kids um, some basic English and um, we ended up having to, um, I don't know what word I'm looking for here guys, but we ended up having to kind of push back uh, with a school counselor um, regarding what we were doing there because they had, um, they had wanted all the information from the kids as far as what we worked on with them. And I, uh, we were going to do some, or we did do some feelings associated things with the kids, some um, activities and whatnot. And so there were worksheets involved. And so they had wanted to get the worksheets from us afterwards so that they could gather information on the kids. Um, and, you know, being that suicide is so highly stigmatized and illegal, um, there, we were just, uh, we were worried. Um, so I think that that administrative part was a little tricky to navigate. Um, but speaking from my own experience, working with the kids uh, was so much fun. We, they were very, very, um, 
uh, active and they, you know, participated right away. Um, those that didn't speak English had friends that would translate for them. And um, it was just a really uh, awesome experience. And I know for some people, my, my group included was, there was some really heavy stuff that came out. And I think, you know, uh, we were talking about it afterwards and it, we figured it was maybe because there was no outlet for them and we were just the third party that came in that wouldn't talk to their parents and wouldn't kind of, you know, tell their business to everyone. Um, and so they opened up and so we, we, we dealt with that as, as that happened. But um, I think it was a very, very impactful experience for us. Any other thoughts or, or questions that are kind of left lingering? I, I have a really basic question. I'm just wondering what your favorite aspects of Malaysian culture were. Definitely the food. <laughs> um, personally, I loved that there was just such a variety of cultures there and I don't want to call it I, like I know the term like salad bowl like I, I just I really appreciated just that there are so many different cultures all infused into one culture and it was really beautiful and we went to the um, actually Amico again and I went to the the National Malaysian uh, Museum I'm not calling it correctly but it was really really um, awesome to be able to see all the different cultures and how they were infused into Malaysia and just to see the history in that so that was personally it was just the diversity there I really appreciated that yeah for me, I definitely love the food and the diversity. And then I was particularly impressed. Um, Malaysia, as we all um, shared previously, um, has multiple uh, major ethnic groups. There's a Muslim, Malays, Chinese, Indian, and other ethnic groups. One thing that shocked me is how comfortable people are co in, um, cohabiting with each other. I remember, you know, I. Even on the flight to Malaysia, I had a conversation with a, a woman from India, a college professor, a really good conversation. And then I realized after being 20 years in the United States, in the Bay Area, where there are a large amount of Chinese and India, I really never talked to uh, someone from India so in a, such an in-depth manner. So going there really opened up this channel of communication. And then to see people, women of Muslim demand, uh, descent or religion walking around so comfortably as if they own the land and they do own the land in a part was very touching to me. And to see a woman in full gear, um, the full gear, you, you, you think about it, the entire body was covered in black except for the eyes, walking side to side with um, I think a, a, maybe a Chinese, very much Asian young woman who was wearing a miniskirt that barely covered her bottom. And two of them was just walking <laughs> alongside with each other on the street it was a very touching scene to me. I'm going to interject as well. The food was delicious mm -hmm. and I think and spicy and great and just so many different cultures, I think as well. And I think people spoke to that just with the like interactions, but I think just that's represented. And I think the way you get to know a place is by its food. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Malaysia is a really cool place to get to discover that. Absolutely. I was very excited about the food. We, um, they have the night markets and I know mm -hmm. a bunch of us went to that for a little bit. And um, I think one of my other favorite parts is uh, there's, because there's so much um, Indian influence in the culture, we got to visit the Batik caves, which were, um, kind of like a very, a very colorful place, but very, um, all the statues of the gods were um, embedded in the, the sides of the caves and whatnot. And um, there's just a lot of activity and a lot of, uh, a lot of fun stuff going on. <laughs> Any other questions or things because I'm, I'm just noting our time and I recognize we only have a few minutes left. So now is, if you have any last minute questions or uh, points you want to share, now would be the time.
All right. Well, I will take that as a, a consent. Oh, actually, I saw Dr. unmute himself, so. Maybe I want to share a little bit, like just a minute from the perspective of, of, of a, 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 an in, internship instructor bringing this group there. And it's, it's, this is, this, that was my first time doing it. I always, I had trepidations for doing that because of a lot of logistic issues, a lot of like anything can go wrong like Murphy's Law and actually things went wrong with me, but which I'm not going to, some of you might have known, but never mind. But it, it, it's, it's a very, um, uh, because you could not have prepared for most things. You cannot orchestrate things to happen to everybody because everybody's needs are different. Everybody go in, even though you might have a common goal, what you want to achieve by everybody arrive at different destinations through a, a very uh, different experiences. And it's very satisfying as, as, as an observer, in a sense, observing the, the journey, each, each person's uh, more engaged, right? Each, each person was engaged in the whole process. And along with that, I, I, get in, I, I was engaged in the sense that I realized that uh, like I, there were questions I asked, and oh, maybe I should have prepared them for this. Maybe I should have prepared them for that. But at the end of the day, there's no way you could prepare everybody, anyone, everybody, 100% to go into anything. Just like we cannot prepare counsel counselors to be able to see all kinds of situation upon graduation, right? So I think it's just to sit along, go along with the right and, and embrace it and be willing to, to just let ourselves be as students, as learners along the way and to allow life to come back to us, to teach us who we are, what we need to do and what how we need to grow. I think that this is a very exciting kind of learning experience when you actually let yourself go in the most um, uncomfortable places or the, the most, uh, is, uh, put it in a way that's like when you, you are outside of your comfort zone so much that, that, that you really get the experience of, of understanding what you're made of and then how you need to transform yourself. So that is a very exciting exciting situations and at the end we learn so much from our hosting people the, the culture uh, much more than what we could what we have actually contributed to them that's all thank you thank you all right well i guess with that uh thank you to dr Young for being adventurous enough to take a group um out to be able to share their stories with you um so I, I really want to be able to take this time to thank uh, Kukrali, Danielle, and Yoon um, really for their time and effort in putting together this great presentation and sharing each of their stories with you. Um, just as some kind of follow-up pragmatic notes, there will be a survey going out within the next few days just to um, ask you about your experience and help us plan for future webinars. Um, your feedback is really important to us and your responses will give us really helpful information um, in planning for future events. You also get a link to all of our upcoming events. Um, I know some of you are uh, repeat attenders, so it's exciting to see you again. We hope to see you at some future um, CRLL webinars. Um, we are also currently planning our winter series on qualitative methodology, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you have any feedback or questions or would like to get in contact with any of the presenters, um, please feel free to um, reach me, reach out via email to the um, Zoom information email that you got, and I'll be happy to connect to you. So. Um, thank you again to all of our presenters and for all of you for attending.